Amen. I want to jump right in today because I have so much out of Scripture that I want to share with you. The Bible talks so much about this idea of joy, and I want to share it with you because I think it's really going to help. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit, the result of God working in a person's life is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul lists here the effects of having God work in a person's life, and it's a long list, and it's a really significant list. And the order of things matters in the Greek, and so right off the top, he says the most prominent thing you're going to get from having God working in your life is love. And you can see that. If you see somebody who, who maybe is a bit distant from God or hasn't ever come across the line of faith and they, they give themselves to Christ, you begin to see changes that God works in their life and they begin to be a better, more loving dad or mom and a better, more loving uh, husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend. You see love welling up in them as God infuses them, I believe literally, with his love. It's the fruit, the effect of his spirit. And Paul says the most prominent thing you'll notice when someone gives themselves to God, and God begins to work in them is this overwhelming sense of love. But I want you to notice what's second. The second thing he lists here, the second most prominent thing someone will get when they give themselves to God is a sense of joy. I mean, it's not saying too much to say that Christians, followers of Jesus, should be about the most joy-filled people on the planet. Because God is literally infusing us with not just his love, but with his joy. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 15. Look at this verse. It says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, so remain in my love. And if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And he said, I have told you this so that, what do you think he's going to say? What do, you, what do you think he's trying to tell us? You know, there's a lot of things I could do, I could put in there to finish that. This is right at the end of his life here on earth. He's getting ready to be arrested, so his, his words are very urgent and clear. And he's saying, I want you to stay connected to God. I want you to stay connected to me, stay connected to the love that we have for you and for each other. And if you do that, what? I mean, I would say maybe if you do that, you'll stray strong to the end. If you do that, you'll, your faith will grow. If you do that, you'll feel assurance and boldness. There's a lot of things you could say. But what does Jesus say? He says, I have told you this so that, you, that my joy may be in you, and so that your joy may be complete. He said, I've told you this so that, that my joy would be put into your life and your joy would be complete and full. Stay connected to God. Stay connected to me so that you may have complete joy. It's not an overstatement to say that followers of Jesus should be the most joy-filled people on the planet. But now if you've been to some churches, <laughs> you know this is not necessarily the truth. Sometimes churches are the most joyless places on the planet. I don't, I don't understand the, con the conflict there, but it's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, I think the Bible would tell us that following Jesus leads to joy. I think you could put it just that simple, that if you're following Jesus with your life, it's going to lead you to a sense of joy. There's a problem is, is it doesn't feel like life sometimes, does it? I mean, if you've been to a funeral in the last couple of years, especially if someone you really loved, really were close to, then this doesn't feel like your experience. If you've been through a divorce recently, this doesn't feel like your experience. If you've lost your job or if you're kind of at the end of your rope financially and you're struggling to pay your bills, this doesn't feel like your experience. You know, if you've ever cried out to God, especially me recently, and, and felt like your prayers didn't get past the ceiling, you just felt like you're all alone in this world, this doesn't feel like your experience. And yet, the Bible is clear from front to back that following God should lead to joy, that God will literally infuse your life with joy. Now, why is it that we don't, that we don't feel that way sometimes? I think one of the reasons is that we've misunderstood what joy really is. I would suggest to you that joy is deeper than probably what you've experienced or thought of before. I would tell you that your joy is not tethered to your circumstances. Joy in your life is not completely synonymous with the things that you face, the circumstances of your day, the good and the bad. Joy is not completely tied to there. It's, it's deeper than that. It's, it's richer and fuller than just your experiences. Let me give you a couple analogies that maybe would help with that. Joy, picture joy as the climate you live in and circumstances are today's weather forecast. You know, so we, we live in a climate here in, in Tennessee that's pretty mild, hot summers, but pretty mild winters, kind of all of that. There's different climates around the country. You could move to Minnesota and be a very different feel, or Seattle, you have a lot more rain. You could move to Alaska and have a lot of cold, or Hawaii and have a lot of warmth. 
And people sometimes move because of climate. I, I have a friend who used to, or still lives in Alaska, and, and she lives kind of in the interior part of Alaska and surrounded by mountains. So it's the hottest part in the summer in Alaska and the coldest part in the winter. And she says the temperature will drop below zero in October and they won't see temperatures above zero till April, even on the highs of the day. They'll never crack zero for like six months out of the year. If God wanted me to go there, he'd have to put like a statue of Jesus appear in my backyard. I'm not sure he could talk me into going to that part of Alaska. He might, but I'm not sure he could do it. Now, Hawaii, it'd be a pretty easy sell. If God wanted me to go to Hawaii, I think I'm open to that. I'm willing to serve, you know, it's the cross I have to bear. I'm willing to serve you, Lord. Wherever, if it's San Diego or Hawaii, I'm, I'm willing to go in a heartbeat, right? Uh, so some of people move for climate, but I have never heard of someone moving because of today's weather forecast. What's going to rain today? Pack your bags. We're out of here right? It's going to be a little hotter than normal. I'm sick of this. We're done. You know what moves because of the forecast? They move maybe because of climate, but not, well, joy is the climate you live in. Circumstances are the day's weather forecast. Let me give you a different angle. I like this one actually better. I think the, the circumstances are the cash in your pocket and joy is your emergency fund. So circumstances are the things that come in and out of your day. You may, you may get a little bit of good things. You give a little bit of bad things. It kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes you have more coming in than going out. Sometimes you have more going out than coming in, and it kind of goes back and forth. But joy is that emergency fund. You know, Dave Ramsey has made a lot of money saying you don't just live by what you have in your pocket. You put a little back. So when you have a little extra going out than coming in, you can fall back on that emergency fund. And I think that's what joy is. Joy is deeper than just your circumstances. Joy is more than just what comes in and out on a particular day. Joy is more than that. And God says he wants us to remain connected to him, to the love that he has for us, in part so that his joy would be in us and that our joy would be complete. Paul says that when God comes and works in your life, one of the main effects of it is you will have abundance amounts of joy. Christians, followers of Jesus, should be among the most joy-filled people on the planet but it's deeper than what we think of. Now, I don't want to take the cash in your pocket analogy and push it too far and you know, run it in the ground, but I want to get very close to that. I want to push it pretty hard. So I want to take the rest of our time and kind of live with that one for a minute because I think there's a lot we can grab a hold of in a tangible way thinking of it that way. So the first thing I want to suggest to you is we need to stop living paycheck to paycheck when it comes to your joy. So many people live in the moment of their circumstances for joy. So if things are going well today, they're feeling good. If things are not going well today, they're feeling bad. They evaluate the last 24 hours. It's either a good day or a bad day, and that's where their mood's at, based on how the last 24 hours have gone. Often those same people tie that to the reactions that are out of their control from other people. So if my kids are well-behaved, I'll be in a good mood. If my kids are ill-behaved, it's, it's on, you know? If my boss is good in a good mood today, I'll be in a good mood today. And then if I'm in a bad mood today, then my wife's in a bad mood. Then my kids are in a bad mood. Then we kick the dog. It, it just all kind of goes down the hill, right? It's all out of somebody else's control. And yet the Bible says that joy is so much deeper than that. It's more rich than that. And so I want to challenge you. Stop living paycheck to paycheck, day to day, moment to moment, with the way that you have your moods. That's not what the Bible talks about when it says it wants you to be filled with joy. Look what James tells us. James says it a little bit different way. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, to put that in a nutshell, he's saying that when you go through a hard time, you're going to grow more out of that than when you go through easy times. And if you're not in the middle of a hard time right now, that makes sense to you. If you're, if you're struggling, that may not make sense at all. But if you're kind of past a struggle... You can look back and say, well, yeah, when I was going through that medical scare or when I had that financial crisis or lost my job, that was hard. I don't want to do it again. But, man, we were so connected to God. We just had to lean on him so much. He was there for us. I mean, you, you grow. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that true? Am I the only one who feels that way? Everybody's giving me blank stares. Isn't that true? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so you, you can experience that. But look what the words he uses there in James 1. He says, first of all, consider, consider pure joy. He doesn't say pretend that it's joyful or feel joyful or let your emotions be joyful. He says consider. It's a, it's a cognitive term. It's, it's think about it this way. You know, take your mind and orient it around. Even though the day-to-day -day is really hard right now, I'm going to consider it joyful because I know who made this world. I know who wound it up. and I know who's going to wind it down. And I'm in his hands. It's going to be okay. It's going to be good. Even though right now it's tough, I know who, who created this world, I know who's going to wind it down, and I'm in his hands. And because we know who God is, and we know all that God has already done, 
we can face tough times with joy. But then look what he says after that. He says, consider pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, produces perseverance. He says, because you know. You know, when you're going through a hard time, what do you know? There's a lot you don't know when you're going through a hard time. If your relationships are crashing or if your health's a mess or your finances are scary, there's so much you don't know. There's confusion, there's, there's um, fuzziness in terms of what's real and what's not real, what's going to be, what's worry, what's not. There's so much you don't know when you're going through hard times. But, but James says, focus on what you do know. What do you know in the middle of that? You know who God is. You know what he's done. You know he's there for you. And you can grab a hold of what you know amidst of all you don't know, and you can come out of that with a sense of joy. Not because it's easy, but because it's good. Joy says, because I know what God has already done for me, and because I know who he is, I can be joyful even during very difficult times. I think the Christmas story lends itself to this. You read through the Christmas story, all the Christmas songs have joy in them, seems like somewhere. It's a big theme of the Christmas story. And if you read the story about Mary or if you read the story about Elizabeth or if you read the story about the wise men or the shepherds, joy just comes out of this over and over. They talk about joy, they sing about joy, they declare joy. And yet, there are circumstances. Mary was an unwed, impoverished fiancé who, who had to tell her fiancé that she had not slept with, that she was now pregnant by an angel. That's a tough circumstance. Elizabeth was an old woman trying to raise it, going to be raising a baby. She's pregnant with a child, going to be raising this baby who would later be beheaded. That's a tough circumstance. The shepherds left their flocks out in the field to go hang out with the baby in a manger and then see shepherds and, and all of that, and now the angels, and now they've got to go back and hope their sheep are all there, but they were singing with joy, even though it's a tough circumstance. The wise men were under threat from Herod of their life, and yet they were so exuberant about the joy they had because it's deeper than your circumstances. Joy is deeper than your circumstances. I, I can think of no better example than this, than Anne Frank. I read about Anne Frank this week in preparation for this. She moved, I didn't realize this, she moved from Germany when she was only four years old. Hitler had taken power, the Nazi party had taken power. And uh, so Otto Frank, her father, m took her and her sister and his, his wife and the four of them moved uh, from Germany because of the, the anti-Semitic rhetoric that the Nazi party was spouting. They moved out of there and they moved to the Netherlands. They started over. It was hard, it was their home. They'd always lived in Germany, but they said it's bigger than this, and it's pretty dangerous here. And things began to get bad and worse in Germany, but in the Netherlands it was peaceful and it was safe. And so they were there for several years. In fact, from, from the time she was four to just before her 11th birthday, everything was peace and fine in the Netherlands. And then Germany attacked Poland and occupied Poland, and then they attacked Netherlands and they occupied the Netherlands. And all of a sudden, Amsterdam was not a safe place for a Jew anymore. And so everything began to get a little tough. And Frank wrote in her diary, said, after May, May 1940, the good times were few and far between. First there was the war, then the capitulation, then the arrival of the Germans, which is when the trouble started for the Jews. Over the next two years, it was just scary and tense, but it wasn't quite as bad. And then right before her 13th birthday, or on her 13th birthday, rather, she received a diary and began to write the words that now people have read for, for decades. And shortly after her 13th birthday, her sister got a letter in the mail, her older sister, saying she needed to report to this work camp. And Otto realizes the writing on the wall, it's too, it's too tough. And so he, he took all his family and he went into a dark, damp, cramped little room in the back of his shop and he hid there for the next two years and one month. 25 months that historians think maybe she didn't even come out of that room once, that she stayed in that room the entire time. Dark, damp, crowded, 13-year-old girl and her older sister and mom and dad. And it's while she was in there, bored out of her mind, scared for her life, that she began to write these words that were sometimes in despair, sometimes profound, sometimes just silly like a 13-year-old might write. And she wrote all these words to record the experience for her. Two years later, an anonymous tip betrayed them, someone probably they knew well, no one knows for sure who that was, and the Nazis came in and arrested them and sent them off to a concentration camp in the northeastern part of the Netherlands. They were there for a short time before being sent to Auschwitz, which is now famous. 
when they got to Auschwitz, Auschwitz's uh, policy was different than the one in the Netherlands. In Auschwitz, the men and women were completely separate. So here comes this dad and mom and two girls, and immediately dad was separated off by himself, and the mom and girls were separated off by their, their selves, and Otto Frank would never see his wife or daughters ever again. They were taken off into terrible circumstances, day in, day out, fear, torture, uh, you know, pain, lack of food, poor sanitation. And they were there for, for, for uh, several months before the daughters were taken from their mother and sent to a different concentration camp. The mother, in great despair, historians say, died only a few months later, not because necessarily things changed, just because her heart was broken. These, these two girls were now out of her care, out of her watch, out of her hands, and she was all alone, and she died within a few months of illness. They took the two girls to a, a different concentration camp where the work was hard, the food was scarce, the sanitation was horrible, disease was rampant. And these two girls were there for just a short month, few, short few months before they contracted a disease and they died within a few days of one another, only weeks before the Russians came and liberated the camp. When the war was over, Otto Frank, who had survived the whole experience, went back home desperately searching for his wife, desperately searching for his daughters, only to find that they were all gone. A friend of his came up and, and brought this uh, little book, his Anne's Diary, and for months they said he couldn't read it, he couldn't open it, couldn't bear the thought of reading these words that she had written that he didn't even ever know before. But finally when he opened it up, he began to see these amazing, profound words from this little 13-year-old, now 15-year-old, lost girl. One of the places she wrote, she said, the best remedy for those who are afraid, lonely, or unhappy is to go outside somewhere where they can be quiet, alone with the heavens, nature, and God. Because only then does one feel that all is as it should be. Now make sure you remember, she wrote this not sitting out on a hillside underneath a tree contemplating about God. She wrote this in a dark, damp, crowded room where she was unable to leave. She was writing about sitting underneath the heavens for memory because she couldn't do it anymore. That which she's probably taken for granted, like we all do, was now taken from her. Some of her entries were desperate, some were depressed, some were amazingly hopeful. Others were just kind of silly. I love this one. She says, boys will be boys, and even that wouldn't matter if we could only prevent girls from being girls. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? I think she understood better than any of us may ever understand how joy and our circumstances are completely detached from one another. They're not tethered. And joy is so much richer and deeper. One of the most famous things she ever wrote was, it's utterly impossible for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering, and death. I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. And yet, when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty too shall end, that peace and tranquility will return once more. That's joy. That's joy that's deeper than your day-to-day. -day. That's joy that's deeper than your circumstances. And that's the joy that God promises to us even when we're going through tough times, even when you've lost a loved one, even when you're struggling financially, even when your health is scary. God promises us joy. I want to challenge you not to live paycheck to paycheck. And second, I want to challenge you to open a savings account as it relates to joy. You know, especially if you struggle with depression or discouragement or, or uh, fear, worry, I want to challenge you, to, when you're having good days, when there's more coming in than going out, to find a way to record that for yourself. Write that down, journal it, put it on note cards so you can see it, because then when you have a dip and when things go bad, you can pull out that savings, if you will, and you can look over the things that God has already done, not just one day, someday in the Bible, but in your life, the way he impacted you and helped you and sustained you. I mean, if you struggle, as so many people do, with discouragement, depression, and anxiety, having a, a stack of savings that you can call on in an emergency can be utterly helpful. You know, for some of you, you're, you're, you're saying, I don't, I don't have that. I, I need that now, and I don't have, I can work on that later, but I don't have that now. Right now, everything's hard and difficult, and I don't have that reservoir to pull from. I want to challenge you to open your thoughts, because God has already done so much for you. God has already done so much for me, things I take for granted. He's put us in this country that's free, that allows us to, to go about and operate without fear of people coming in and taking us from a hiding place. He's, he's put us in, in bodies that are mostly working well. You may have a few little quirks and dings, but mostly they're working well. I sat with the Smiths this week up in the hospital as their seven-year-old boy was recovering from an appendicitis. And we talked in such, they talked, I just listened, 
in such profound terms about how they took you know, things like appendix, appendixes for granted until their little boys quit working and now had such a big part of their life as his little appendix that wasn't working now. And we have so many miracles going on in our body every day that we don't think of until one of them doesn't work or one of our kids don't work or one of our parents don't work. But there's things that God gives us every day the opportunities we have, the people we've met, the, the love. And outside of all of that, on top of all that, God has sent us Jesus, the very best he had. Born in a manger, yes, but lived to die so that you and I could be free. You and I could come back to God. You and I could, could have an opportunity with him in heaven. And over a hundred times in scripture, God tells us to be thankful or to give thanks because God wants us to know that we know that we know so much has already been given to us already. And it builds for us a savings account of joy that we can tap into when th times are hard. Romans chapter eight, Paul writes, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If God is willing to give us his son, his own flesh and blood, sent as a baby, but born to die, a horrible death that God saw coming. If God's willing to do that for us, He's not going to leave you stranded. He's not going to be bad tomorrow, even though he's good today. He's not going to be weak tomorrow, even though he's powerful today. God is for us, and God is with us, and God challenges us to respond to that. That's the gospel, that God sent Jesus, the very best he had, so that we could respond to that and say, God, I accept that, I own that, I want that in my life. And he would infuse us, not just with forgiveness and love, but with joy. You know, if you're, if you're far from God, the best thing you could do for your anxiety and your worry and your depression and your fear and your struggle is to submit yourself to God. Take the burdens that you carry and hand them to Jesus. And there's just no way you're going to know how powerful that is to try it. I'd love to sit down and talk with you if that's where you find yourself. Look at a couple of these verses we'll use to close. Romans chapter 12, verse 12, Paul writes, be joyful in hope. Now, why do you need hope? You need hope if times are hard. If times are good, you don't need hope. You've got reality, right? You only need hope when times are hard. And he says, when times are hard, in hope, be joyful. That's because it's bigger than your circumstances. You, you dig deep into that well of thanksgiving and gratitude and joy that God has given you. And Nehemiah, Nehemiah rallies the people to build the walls and restore them. And when they do that, they give thanks to God for helping them do it. And then he says this amazing words. He says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. He tells them to go have a party because the joy of your Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. We don't think about joy being a strong thing, but what he's saying is if you have joy from God, that will sustain you this deep well that you can pull in even when your circumstances are horrible. And that's strength that you can count on if you're in a concentration camp or if you're in a bad marriage or if you're in a difficult job or if you're in a financial strain. That joy of the Lord can be your strength. I heard a story several years ago about a, a king who, who met this young boy, a beggar, along the streets, and he adopted him to be part of his own family. He didn't have a mom and dad to help him, so he adopted him in. And the kid was in rags, and he took those rags and gave him brand new, wonderful clothes, the best that money could buy, and he was all dirty, so he cleaned him all up and got him all together and got his hair cut and all the stuff that you do. And he took him to the doctor and got him all healthy and got him some nutrients and some vitamins and all that to get him all strengthened up and the best food and the best care and the best education and the best, the best, the best. And the little boy began to change dramatically from this little beggar, um, you know, withering child to this thriving youngster playing in his yard and swimming in the creek and doing all the things little boys are supposed to do when they're not worried about their next meal and all of that. And so the story goes, the king was doing great and felt really good about it. And one day, the little boy was out playing, and the servants went in to clean the little boy's room and called the king down and said, you need to come see this. And they went down there, and behind the, behind the dresser, they pulled it out, and there was a little bag of food the little boy had packed just in case dad didn't come through tomorrow. And in his sock drawer, there was a little bit of bread underneath the socks just in case dad wasn't good tomorrow. And then over underneath the bed, there was a little bit of food stuffed away just in case dad was poor tomorrow because he was used to that. That's how the little boy survived for so many years. I have to make sure I have enough because I'm the only one to count on. And so even though this little boy was now a prince, even though this little boy had everything, he was still living like a beggar because he was just convinced that maybe tomorrow will be the day that dad doesn't come through. Maybe tomorrow is the day that dad's not good or that dad's not kind or that dad's not enough. Application's pretty clear. 
If you've given yourself over to God, you are a child, a son or daughter of the king. God who, who created this whole world, God who gave us Jesus the best that he, he could ever offer, loves you and he loves me and he wants to give you not just Jesus and forgiveness, he wants to give you everything that you need. And that is a sense of joy that's hard to describe. But we go around living like beggars, assuming that today is the only day we got. Better be good today because tomorrow you never know and it's all about me, it's all about myself and what I want. And we live like beggars. When we serve a, a king, we love a king. A king loves us. The book of Habakkuk has a great... The whole book is good. You can read that later. But the, the, it's all about, they were going through a really difficult time. God's people were. And so Habakkuk was crying out to God saying, God, you got to help us. Here's all of these terrible things happening. And God really doesn't answer that. God doesn't say he's going to do anything immediately. In fact, God says, I've done a lot of good things in the past and I'm going to come through again. But no immediate promise. And the last couple of verses of Habakkuk say, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines and the olive crops fail and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior for the sovereign Lord is my strength. And when you read that, you wonder, how does he do that? I mean, how's a guy who has no sheep or cattle or food or provision, how can he be joyful in the midst of that? But I think you get a little picture earlier. The beginning of chapter 3 says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shigianoth. It's a Hebrew word. We'll talk about that in a minute. He says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. He says, God, you've done great things in the past. I want you to do it again. Do it again. And then he uses this word, this shigianoth, which is a musical term that means expressive and exuberant. So what he's saying is this whole last chapter, chapter three, is all a song. It's not a poem. It's a song. And he's saying it's to be sung, and it's not to be sung as a dirge or a funeral march. It's to be sung with exuberance and excitement because God has done great things in the past. God is going to do great things in the future, and we will rejoice in that even though the present looks really pretty bleak. That is joy. It's what God wants for you. It's what God wants for me.